Uh, good evening to you all. Um, as I, as, uh, today's uh, topic is um, uh, evaluation of the prosthetic uh, aortic valve. Um, and uh, as being part of this uh, ECHO basic series, uh, we will stick to basics. And um, like I say every time, uh, today's talk also is mainly focused on uh, people who are in their initial stages of doing ECHO. Uh, probably uh, for people who are a little uh, intimidated by looking at valves or prosthetic valves. Uh, so just um, the basics and uh, hopefully uh, there will be something um, for you all to take back, uh, maybe something new also. Um, much literature is already available in the form of guidelines or uh, textbooks or uh, articles. Uh, so much is already there. So um, I will be bringing in a few cases, mainly to kind of highlight a few uh, points. It's largely going to be a, a case-based um, uh, uh, sharing this uh, evening. Uh, so when we say uh, prosthetic valves, what we mean is uh, we mean artificial valves. Um, the other word is uh, native valves. So prosthetic, um, we mean artificial valves. There are different kinds of these artificial valves or prosthetic valves. And um, uh, there is a picture here which kind of shows the different kinds of uh, valves. So uh, starting on one end, you have this uh, bi-leaflet valve. It is called bi-leaflet simply because there are two leaflets. The other is the single leaflet or the tilting disc valve. Then you have the ball and cage valve. And then you have a whole lot of uh, tissue valves uh, or bioprosthetic valves, as we call it. Um, uh, they are called bioprosthetic or tissue valves because uh, they are derived from uh, either uh, animal or sometimes even uh, human tissue. Uh, in that, you may have some which have stents like this. Uh, they are called stented valves, stented bioprosthesis. And then you can have uh, some which are uh, stentless valves also. And then here down, you have uh, transcatheter valves, which are also a kind of bioprosthetic valves. So it is important to be aware of uh, what are the different um, uh, valves that are uh, available uh, so that we will be able to um, assess uh, better. Uh, so this is just uh, what I just mentioned. Broadly, they are biological valves or bioprosthetic valves. And then you have the mechanical valves, um, as I just uh, mentioned. So among the mechanical valves, you have the bileaflet valve, you have the single tilting disc valve, and you have the ball and cage valve. And um, in the biological valves or the bioprosthetic valves, you have the stented valves and the stentless valves. Then, of course, there are uh, transcatheter valves also. Uh, this particular um, uh, table is from the 2017 EACVI uh, prosthetic valve guideline. Um, this is again to highlight the same thing. Uh, on the right side, you have the metal valve, a bileaflet valve. And on this side, uh, you have a biologic valve or a bioprosthetic valve. These bio, biologic or bioprosthetic valves generally don't require um, or require uh, anticoagulation for a shorter period of time, whereas this would require anticoagulation for a lifetime. Uh, this no anticoagulation is not really true, uh, but it may be a little uh, limited. Um, the other thing is uh, biological valves uh, probably um, often last a little less longer than mechanical valves. So mechanical valves are very durable. And hence in our country uh, or in low and middle income countries also, you will see a lot of these kind of mechanical uh, valves, uh, especially since most people uh, would want a procedure, um, a one-time procedure. Um, again, just to take a, a closer look at these valves uh, and certain terminologies um, that we generally keep referring to. So you have an occluder. This is a ball and cage valve, a type of ball and cage valve. There are many types of each of these valves, but I've just put four uh, different types of valves. This is a ball and cage valve. What you see here is a ball and you have a, re a restraining cage here. And then you have what you call as a suture ring or a sewing ring, uh, that is S-E-W-I-N-G, sewing ring, uh, with uh, which the surgeon stitches it to the 
patient's uh, native tissue. Uh, so what happens is the disease, diseased valve is taken out first, and then in uh, any of these valves um, are chosen, and then uh, the suture ring is uh, sutured to the suture ring or the sewing ring. Um, here you have another uh, commonly used type of valve, which is a bileaflet valve. As you can notice here, uh, the central orifice is uh, generally a little smaller, uh, smaller than the other two lateral orifices. So there are three orifices, one, uh, two, and there are, uh, that's the third one. So there are three orifices. The central orifice is generally uh, smaller than the other two orifices. And here you have a tilting disc valve and um, you have these struts, um, one strut here and one strut here on the outside and an outer and an inner strut. And uh, then of course, uh, uh, the same thing, you have a sewing ring. This is a bioprosthetic valve. And uh, what you can see is um, tissue, uh, which may be from, uh, uh, which may be bovine, which may be like uh, from a cow um, or a pig, which is porcine. Um, and uh, then you have this uh, stem uh, onto which it is supported. And then you have a, a sewing ring. So these stented bioprosthetic valves will uh, have a very typical appearance, uh, like a crown, uh, generally, when you look at the valve, with normal looking um, uh, leaflets inside it. Normal, I mean, uh, like native leaflets. But the odd thing is that you will see uh, uh, these um, uh, stents uh, popping up uh, in the form of the appearance of a crown. So all, all prosthetic valves have some amount of um, obstruction. That is something to know. So it is not like uh, native valves, and we cannot expect it to be like that also. Uh, so this is uh, how the pro, uh, flow profile generally is uh, across a prosthetic valve. And um, uh, on the left side, you have a bioprosthetic valve. And on the right side, you have a metallic bileaflet valve. Uh, again, showing the three orifices. You have a central orifice and you have two uh, lateral orifices. Uh, so what has been shown here is that through the central orifice, the velocity will be higher and hence there will be a greater fall in pressure. Uh, whereas in the lateral, uh, it is not so much. And the flow profile is generally better in a bioprosthetic valve as compared to a uh, metallic valve. Uh, just now coming um, to the uh, absolute uh, essentials of uh, before starting a study. Uh, so uh, these are all things that we pay attention to. Uh, we look, uh, get the patient's details. Apart from that, height and weight for the purpose of body surface area is extremely important, as you will see, know and see why uh, very shortly. And uh, the date of the surgery, when was the surgery done, uh, is also extremely important. That again, uh, in the course of uh, the next few minutes, you will know. Because uh, something um, which happens very acutely, uh, you think of certain causes, something which has been gradual over a long period of time, over months or years, you think of certain uh, etiologies. And uh, it's also very, extremely essential to know what valve was put in. So uh, often patients may not uh, get the records or uh, may be hesitant or uh, um, whatever the reason may be, you should, uh, we all should try extra hard uh, to make sure that we have the details of the previous surgery and what valve specifically was uh, put in. That also we will know uh, shortly uh, why. Then uh, another thing which is often not really uh, paid much emphasis or much attention to is serial echocardiography. So uh, these patients, it's possible that uh, five echoes have been done in the last 10 years. It is very important to see uh, sequentially uh, what was uh, the report, what were the gradients, what was the valve area, all those things. And that also adds a lot of information to our final assessment, uh, which we may be doing today. Uh, another question to very ask is uh, adherence to anticoagulation. So um, uh, these patients, we should ensure uh, and uh, check and know uh, what their PT INR is and uh, whether they are uh, on anticoagulation. All those questions uh, we need to ask. And um, you know, finally, we need to uh, know what is the patient's uh, symptomatic status. Is the patient asymptomatic? 
uh, or is the patient uh, has the patient come in an emergency the two are different again we will be thinking of different uh, different possibilities when we are assessing such a patient um, also uh, by cases i will be illustrating the need uh, to look at high output state like pregnancy or anemia um and no need to go into detail right now but as we look at the cases we'll uh, reach there so these are again from the eacba guidelines uh, so when you see something like this uh, don't get uh, scared or intimidated you just look at the headings here uh, one is uh, things uh, what i've just said which is the clinical information the height weight body surface area blood pressure heart rate then you look at the valves itself uh then you look at the doppler data pretty much uh, like how we generally assess uh, any valve and then you look at the um, lvrv size pa pressures uh, etc so these are uh, this table is also from the 2017 uh, guidelines and uh, as you can see now uh, you have one category which is normal one is possible obstruction and uh, the third is significant obstruction uh i will be referring to these numbers and also these tables um, very frequently so and these are all available but just to jog your memory it is uh, good to know that there are certain qualitative parameters there are semi quantitative and quantitative parameters and uh, uh, what do we mean by qualitative uh, we just look at what is the valve structure what is the shape of the doppler curve um that is qualitative a semi quantitative we do some basic measurements like looking at the acceleration time or looking at uh, the acceleration time to ejection time ratio i'll be uh, dwelling on all all of these things in a bit of detail um and then you look at uh, gradients and your uh, effective orifice area and your doppler velocity uh, index uh, so certain numbers um, to kind of grossly remember Uh, so less than 3 meter per second is normal less than uh, 20 mm of hg is usually normal effective orifice area greater than 1.1 uh, is normal doppler velocity index greater than or equal to 0.35 uh, is also normal now um, uh, as i said some uh, these prosthetic valves are intrinsically have some amount of obstruction so that is why in a native valve you have the value of 0.5 whereas uh, here you take a value of 0 greater than or equal to 0.35 as normal the rest of the categories are um, are the same um uh, these uh, i i particularly like this um, illustration a lot and find it very useful this is from the 2009 uh, a american society of echo guidelines and um, uh, this is very very helpful so in many of our cases i will be referring to this also so essentially it starts off by looking at what is the jet velocity then you look at what is the doppler velocity index that is the second thing uh, that you see here so jet velocity doppler velocity index uh, then you look at the jet contour what is the shape of the jet and then you think of different possibilities which we will uh, come to with the help of uh, some cases Uh, so as i said um um now you can for a moment uh, leave all these numbers and uh, um maybe the guidelines and these flow charts algorithms aside and just look at uh, see yourself uh, doing an echo uh, on a patient with uh, an aortic prosthesis um before kind of uh, getting all um, flustered and very anxious about how you will report it uh what you need to do is uh, as usual you will go first to the parasternal long axis view uh, uh, that is where you will start and sequentially you will, you will go through all the uh, views that are there uh, in the normal echo study um so the first thing that we would like to look at is uh, to see what is the valve structure looking like what is the valve looking like uh, to the uh, to my naked eye uh, um Uh, am i able to see something am i able to make out something is there something gross that i need to pay attention to are these uh, leaflets um, uh, are they is it metallic is it bioprosthetic uh, is it bioprosthetic um, these are all things that um, uh, we kind of need to pay attention to um, am i audible just wanted to check once again 
Yes, sir. You are audible. Yes. Um, so, uh, like I said, you look at the valve structure, you look at the uh, mobility of the leaflets, you look at uh, uh, what is the kind of leaflets that you are seeing. Is there a ball? Uh, what is the color flow pattern? These are all things that you try to assess. Um, I, I, I kind of uh, dwell on this a little, mainly because many times I've seen um, echoes being done. The moment the prosthetic valve uh, comes, uh, the, our first instinct uh, is to look at this very cursorily and then quickly jump to looking at gradients. Uh, but um, uh, that should not be the case. Uh, it requires more time. It requires a little more effort also than looking at in a normal patient. Because uh, there is so much of echogenic uh, material, the views may not be great. Uh, many of these, these patients may probably have uh, other issues like bad lungs and things like that. Uh, so that will really test our patients. So we need to spend that time to try to see uh, the valve structure carefully. Now, this is just, uh, just to kind of highlight what I'm trying to say. Now, uh, this is... Um, um, all, all the images that I'm uh, going to uh, put forward uh, today are a mix of um, uh, our images as well as uh, some images from um, literature online. Uh, so, I, But I'm not going to specify each time uh, what is from where because the whole point is for us to kind of get the point, uh, get the key messages. Um, so as you can see here, the one that is playing, um, uh, you can see that it is obviously a flail. Um, uh, uh, it, it's a um, uh, valve which is rocking. Uh, it's an unstable valve. So that is something which is quite obvious. Um, uh, whereas uh, in the next one uh, that you can see here, uh, you can see that the valve is seated quite well and uh, it is quite stable. So you've already made certain observations by uh, looking at the valve. Uh, likewise, you can see here that it is not only one prosthetic valve, that it is two prosthetic valves. This is the parasternal, all are parasternal uh, or rather long axis views. This is also the parasternal long axis view. But what you can see is that there is another valve here, uh, namely a ball and cage valve at the mitral position. Um, so uh, you've kind of made some uh, observations there. Um, this, as you go and see, you can see that uh, uh, there appears to be a kind of a stent uh, on the wall here and some leaflets inside which are looking a little uh, shaggy. So um, again, if you uh, find out what uh, uh, the details are, you will realize that this is a transcatheter or a TAVI valve and um, uh, there is something inside uh, which you need to pay attention to. Uh, and if you don't pay attention to it, uh, then uh, you can miss findings also. So, oh, uh, uh, what are we trying to see? Why are we trying to do this? Uh, we are trying to do this because there can be different uh, reasons why a valve is diseased. Well, something can be frankly broken like this, like the strut can be uh, fractured and broken. Um, if it's a bioprosthetic valve like this, with the, it's a stented bioprosthetic valve, you can see that all these leaflets are completely degenerated. Um, so that kind of information you, you can try to see, though it may be difficult because of all, all the metal and the stent and the struts and all that, but still the attempt should be made to try to see it in multiple uh, views. Or it, there can be, they, these are TAVI valves, you can see uh, thrombus on one side or it can be uh, degeneration also. So that is the point of trying to see the valve uh, carefully. Um, because uh, if you can clearly say that uh, the valve is looking absolutely fine, you can see all the details, then you probably will be need to think of non-structural -struct dysfunction of the valve when there is a valve dysfunction. What do I mean by structural uh, dysfunction? Structural dysfunction means uh, that there is wear and tear in the valve, uh, there is calcification, there is uh, damage to the valve per se. But in a non-structural dysfunction, it may be like a, a valve is too small for a given patient or the valve is fine, but the, uh, surrounding the valve, there is a leak. So these are examples of a non-structural uh, dysfunction. So that is important. And those details we can get by looking at the valve um, carefully. Next, we also kind of look at what is the color flow pattern like. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, this is also 
uh, Tavi valve uh, on the left side, uh, and the other side shows a metallic valve. And uh, here you can see a mild uh, paravalvular leak. Whereas in the other one, uh, the images are not great, but you can uh, um, uh, say that it is intravalvular or intra prosthetic uh, leak. Again, the, why is it important? Because the implications are different, the reasons are different. All that we will be coming to by uh, by means of looking at certain uh, cases. So uh, looking at what is the integrate flow like? How is the flow across the uh, um, across the uh, valve leaflets or across the um, uh, occluders or the uh, leaflets? Uh, is it very turbulent or is it looking laminar? Um, all all these are details that we can look at uh, by uh, putting the color on. Now uh, coming to assessing this. So first, we, now we have qualitatively looked at the valve and now we come to uh, measurements. Uh, the first measurement that we look at uh, is the LVOT uh, diameter, which is taken from the parasternal long axis view. Um, this is the view which I have shown before also. You can see this is the native valve, but this is just for the sake of illustration to uh, show that that is how we zoom the valve. Uh, we don't measure it uh, otherwise except uh, for zooming. So zooming is extremely uh, important. Uh, one thing to be mindful of is that uh, LVOT um, um, is uh, a circle. We assume it to be a circle. That is why for LVOT area, we apply the formula pi r square, uh, but it is in reality not always a circle. Uh, and that will have its own uh, implication. But assuming that it is a circle, we want to know what is the area of this particular circle, which is why we uh, measure the LVOT diameter. Um, so we try to see what is the widest LVOT that we are getting when we are assessing the prosthetic valve also. Uh, we cannot be taking uh, LVOT at this red line. So we need to see where is the widest by a little tilting here and there and making sure that it is right in the uh, center. Uh, the other thing that we have already seen before, uh, so as you would have realized, uh, this particular topic uh, of LVOT measurement has already, I've uh, spoken three times so far, and each time I have uh, kind of in some way or the other uh, referred to this LVOT diameter. Uh, the reason is because many times um, I find that measurements are taken in unzoomed views or very hastily um, or where sometimes half-heartedly without uh, fully realizing what the implications can be. But we need to spend that time. We need to zoom it properly. We need to clearly see the hinge points and uh, then measure. So we will be measuring at the annulus and uh, not anywhere uh, below that. Uh, so this is from uh, one of the valve uh, document guidelines. So when we have a prosthetic valve, as you can see here, the recommendation uh, is to measure like this, uh, as has been shown in picture A, and uh, as, as has been shown clearly uh, in this particular D panel. Uh, what you can see is, uh, you see where this valve, uh, the struts or the stent uh, ends, uh, and then uh, from the outer edge to the outer edge is where you uh, measure it. Uh, this is very important uh, for um, uh, TAVI valves, uh, especially because there is no fixed size as such. Um, the valve will take uh, the size of whatever to whatever extent it gets uh, inflated, and hence uh, all calculations should be based on what you measure here and not what is already prescribed uh, or what you already know. Uh, that is the importance of uh, taking it uh, properly. Uh, another technical tip, uh, tip uh, which um, is important, uh, say between uh, pictures C and D, um, is that uh, it always helps uh, for prosthetic valves uh, when we are assessing it to slightly reduce the 2D gain. Uh, as you can see, uh, the D picture uh, panel uh, is seen much, uh, much better than C. Uh, that helps us measure also uh, much better. Uh, sometimes um, uh, a CP can be done, uh, but of course, um, uh, this is only for the sake of illustration here, that this is what we are trying to measure, uh, the area of the LVOT by means of uh, taking the LVOT uh, diameter and using pi r square as a uh, formula. Uh, having uh, once uh, that so the number one is the uh, uh, looking at the valve quality, second is to look at the LVOT diameter. And the third thing 
is to look at the jet contour itself. Um, so if we have a jet which looks like this, which is uh, nice and triangular versus something which is more rounded, um, the rounded one generally points to a more severe obstruction as compared to something which is uh, more peaked and triangular like this. Uh, and as you can see here, these valve flicks at the opening and the closing, uh, these are also important. Uh, these also kind of tell us uh, in a qualitative manner that the valve uh, is opening and closing fairly all right. And uh, this is uh, to, uh, for um, uh, whether it is to look at the valve or whether it is to take Doppler gradients, we should use as many windows as possible. Never just settle with one window uh, and assume everything is all right. Take as many windows as possible and the Doppler gradient also across all these um, windows. Uh, the next thing uh, uh, about uh, uh, semi-quantitative uh, measurement is to um, um, uh, look at the acceleration time. And um, what uh, we have measured here is 90 milliseconds versus 150 milliseconds. That is from the beginning till the peak. That is 150 milliseconds here. Uh, anything more than 100 is uh, abnormal or points to an obstruction. Um, anything less than 100, according to the older um, 2009 uh, guidelines, but according to more recent documents, the uh, number that is referred to often is 80. So um, anything less than 80 is uh, considered normal, and uh, anything more than 100 uh, is certainly considered abnormal. But um, uh, we have to know that uh, this also depends on the LV function and the heart rate, um, uh, because uh, if there is LV dysfunction, uh, even with a not very severely uh, obstructed valve, you can have a prolongation of this acceleration time. Uh, that is when there is LV dysfunction. On the other hand, uh, when there is uh, tachycardia, that also will uh, influence the shape of this particular um, um, uh, contour. Uh, the advantage of this particular uh, measurement or even uh, looking at it qualitatively is that uh, uh, um, if we don't align our uh, Doppler properly, uh, we may underestimate the gradient for sure, but the shape is not going to change. Uh, as in you can uh, never make a triangular uh, Doppler, uh, make it look rounded, even if you are wrong. So that is the advantage. So if something looks rounded, uh, then you certainly need to stop and pay greater attention uh, to your valve as compared to something which looks uh, peaked and uh, triangular. So that is the advantage. Now to correct for this heart rate uh, problem, um, uh, there, uh, there is this ejection time which has been added and the ratio is uh, what we take. Uh, normal is less than 0.32 and abnormal is uh, greater than 0.37. Again, uh, these numbers are slightly different. They, these are from the uh, latest 2017 uh, valve guidelines, prosthetic valve EACBA guidelines. The older 2009 uh, guidelines uh, refer to a number of 0 0.4. In, in any case, um, um, 0 0.37 or 0 0.4 is uh, abnormal. Uh, so how, how, how you do it is uh, from the beginning to the peak is acceleration time. And from the beginning till the end is the ejection time. And the ratio of the two is what you take as acceleration to AT by uh, ET. The next thing that you look at is jet velocity and mean gradient. So you have already taken these um, uh, Doppler profiles by continuous wave Doppler. Uh, you look at what is the velocity. A normal velocity would be less than uh, three meters per second. And an abnormal one would be more than or equal to four meters per second. And likewise, um, the mean gradient. Mean gradient is taken by uh, tracing this, uh, doing a VTI or a velocity time integral. Uh, uh, you get a mean gradient and uh, greater than or equal to 35 millimeters of mercury is um, uh, abnormal versus less than 20, which is uh, normal. Now, mind you, all this applies at a normal stroke volume or a non normal transvalvular flow rate. Uh, if you have uh, a low stroke volume or an abnormal or a, a lower uh, transvalvular flow rate, then obviously your gradients will be low, as in uh, your low flow, low gradient um, aortic stenosis. So the same things will apply and the way of assessing that also will be uh, similar. Uh, as in, uh, you would want to do other things like dobutamine echo and all of that. 
So this is what, uh, again, just to introduce uh, or rather remind uh, uh, us all about the concept of uh, VTI. I just mentioned VTI. So you take this continuous wave Doppler across multiple windows, apical five chamber, apical three chamber, or the apical long axis view, right parasternal view, subcostal view, all these views you take, and uh, you take a continuous wave Doppler, and then you trace it, uh, the VTI. Why do we use VTI? Uh, because we know that uh, blood, is, blood flow across the aortic valve is pulsatile, and um, uh, hence we will have to trace it uh, to get the uh, mean uh, gradient. So uh, the next measurement is the Doppler velocity index. So you have uh, your uh, uh, LVOT velocity divided by your uh, peak aortic uh, velocity, that is by continuous wave Doppler. So your LVOT velocity is by pulse wave Doppler. Your uh, uh, peak velocity, aortic uh, velocity will be by a continuous wave Doppler. So you could take a ratio of the velocities or even better would be to uh, take a ratio of the VTIs. So uh, VTI of the LVOT tracing divided by VTI of the aortic uh, tracing. That gives us a Doppler velocity index. Uh, that is what we also call as a DVI. And a DVI less than 0.25 is considered um, as uh, suggestive of obstruction versus uh, greater than 0.35 as we already looked at. So now uh, this is um, an example again from the 2009 guidelines. What you can uh, see here is um, that the DVI as has been shown here, the ratio has been taken here, 0.39 here, that is uh, normal because the normal is greater than 0.35. As opposed to that, you have here, you have a rounded contour across the aortic valve, uh, prolonged acceleration time, and you have um, an abnormal or a, a reduced uh, DVI of 0 0.18, which is less than 0 0.25. So hence, we say that this is obstruction. Uh, now, just a couple of words about LVOT VTI. So you trace the modal velocity. You, uh, it is by pulse wave Doppler which in the apical five chamber or in the apical three chamber view, just uh, keep it close to the, as close to the valve as possible. But uh, you should get a nice trace like this, a modal velocity. We looked at what is modal velocity. It's a statistical term. Uh, mode is a statistical term, which takes into account what are the, what is the commonest occurring um, event. Um, so here you see different kinds of boxes. The commonest here is the brown box. So like that, uh, you look at uh, what are, what at what velocities are these RBCs in the LVOT uh, oscillating, or what um, what is the maximum number of uh, RBCs uh, oscillating at a particular velocity? That is what we want to know. Uh, so once we come closer to the valve, we find that there is a wide range of uh, velocities. There's a lot of turbulence, and hence we get what we call a spectral broadening like this. So we should aim to keep uh, it as close to the valve, not too far away so that our velocities are underestimated. So if you take it too much towards the LV apex, our velocities will be underestimated. So we should uh, go towards the apex, uh, come towards the valve, and then see what is that perfect uh, spot where uh, there is not much of spectral broadening at, as well as uh, it is not underestimated. Uh, this is just to highlight the point uh, from an aortic stenosis trace that when we trace this continuous wave Doppler, we uh, should make sure that we take the densest part and we don't take these feathery things in the end. Uh, so as has been referred to also in other talks also, we take the chin and not the uh, beard. So uh, the calculation of effective orifice area, looking at the LVOT uh, area by means of uh, pi r square, uh, then looking at the um, LVOT VTI, that the numerator gives the stroke volume, that divided by the aortic continuous wave Doppler VTI, um, that uh, gives us the effective orifice area. And that is how we calculate the effective orifice area. So just to remind us, uh, so that is what, uh, it is based on the law of uh, conservation of mass, the continuity equation, just to look at it and uh, once again, jog our memory. Um, one important thing uh, to remember in prosthetic valves is that the valve size is not the same uh, as effective orifice area. What we are trying to measure is uh, what is the uh, area of flow. Uh, that is what we are trying to see. So um, uh, this pink area is what we are trying to measure. 
So that cannot be done by planimetry or by looking at the label size or uh, any of those things. We will have to calculate it using echo Doppler uh, to know what is the effective orifice area. Why should we know that? Because that is what finally uh, translates to outcomes in the patient. Uh, whether the patient is feeling fine, whether the patient is feeling breathless, uh, whether the patient uh, will live long, uh, many of those things uh, depend on what we find as the calculate as the uh, effective orifice area. Uh, this is another um, uh, illustration which is taken from the guidelines, except that few more parameters are here. So on the one side here, you have um, um, a maximum velocity of 2.4, that is the aortic, a mean gradient of 11, which is normal, anything less than 20. Effective orifice area is greater than 1.1, and hence it's normal. DVI is greater than 0 0.35, and hence it's normal. Acceleration time is less than 100 or even 80, and hence it's normal. As opposed to that, you have um, a gradient, uh, mean gradient more than 40, uh, more than 35, that is abnormal. Effective orifice area is um, also less than uh, 0 0.8, uh, which is abnormal. DVI is less than 0 0.25, which is abnormal. Maximum velocity is uh, uh, greater than 4 uh, meters per second. So all these are abnormal. So this is an obstructed um, valve. So uh, just uh, again, uh, you can pause for a second and just uh, stare at this particular uh, uh, illustration or this table, uh, which I had already shown earlier, but to just uh, get a bearing of the of certain numbers. We don't have to really memorize it uh, and know it uh, by heart or anything, but periodically keep looking so that we know uh, where we are and we should be sure we are not assuming things. So for that sake, uh, um, we need to kind of keep uh, looking at it every now and then. Uh, so I'll come to the first case. Uh, this is a 40-year-old um, female. I had an AVR, uh, 21 uh, Senjuds um, in uh, 2011. Uh, she had stopped uh, all her anticoagulation for many months um, due to uh, anemia. Uh, so that is the reason she had uh, stopped it for many months. And um, so, this parasternal lung I had already uh, shown you. This also I had shown you. What you can see is significant uh, intraaortic uh, or intravalvular um, aortic regurgitation. And uh, this is the five chamber view, which shows uh, turbulence across the aortic valve also. And also you can see some flowing uh, going back. That is the aortic regurgitation. Uh, the most important thing, you see a markedly elevated gradient, so maximum velocity of five plus, and you see a mean gradient of 66, also markedly elevated gradients. Um, so, uh, and you also look at this um, aortic regurgitation, which is quite significant with a very steep uh, pressure uh, half, uh, half time, uh, almost nearing uh, 200. So uh, this is obviously a patient with aortic valve uh, obstruction, high gradients, uh, tongue-shaped or a very rounded contour uh, with the history of a patient stopping anticoagulation in a patient with a metallic valve. Uh, so all these things put together, uh, we uh, come to a conclusion that this patient um, has a prosthetic valve obstruction. So uh, it was a stuck valve. Uh, I don't have um, uh, this clip which is playing, but I had recorded this in um, you know, systole and diastole. And what you can see is this particular uh, leaflet on the right is uh, immobile and um, uh, it continues to be immobile. And the other one also, there is uh, the range of motion is very less, as you can see. This is the maximum and this is the uh, minimum. And what you can see is that it is heavily uh, restricted. So uh, that was the uh, stuck valve. So again, coming back to this particular algorithm. Uh, so um, very high velocities, uh, uh, a tongue-shaped uh, contour, uh, it suggests a uh, prosthetic valve uh, stenosis. So uh, in this case, possibly it was a thrombus. Uh, now we may not always see the thrombus, but uh, looking like this. Uh, sometimes you can, many times you may not be, but that doesn't mean that uh, there is no uh, thrombus. It, it, it is just possible that it is uh, because of the so much of metal, so much of reverberations, uh, that it, uh, you may not be able to see it uh, clearly. In which case, other modal imaging modalities may be required, um, like T or CT, 
uh, which I'll be discussing uh, um, subsequently. So, um, if we don't see any obvious mass looking like this, that doesn't mean it is not there. We have to look into the history, um, uh, look into uh, the other things along with the history. One important point I would like to make here is that uh, this intra-prosthetic AR, as we saw in this particular patient, is also an important sign of a prosthetic valve obstruction. Now, why that happens is when you have a thrombus or anything else which is occluding the opening and closing mechanism, the valve is not going to uh, fully close. And as a result, it is also going to leak. So that is the main reason why you get uh, AR. So the presence of AR, uh, so you cannot look at it in boxes. Um, like um, how you may think of native valves, say, for example. Here, uh, an intra-prosthetic AR many times may be a sign of prosthetic uh, obstruction, as um, in this particular case. Uh, there is one more thing that is uh, shown here um, as panus. What you can see here, this again I will come to subsequently. This is like a fibrous tissue or like a scar, which kind of uh, grows from the periphery. So thrombus is generally seen more centrally, whereas this is generally seen more peripherally. It grows in from the native tissue onto the valve and comes into the valve and then later causes uh, obstruction in varying degrees. So panus is generally hard uh, to also see, uh, come to a conclusion. Uh, many times it is uh, taking into account the history, the duration, uh, when was the surgery done, what are the symptoms like, uh, taking into account all those things. And specifically, if we want to prove that it is uh, panis, uh, then we will uh, some many a time need to take the help of other imaging modalities like uh, TE or CT. Um, and of course, um, uh, if a surgery, uh, so surgery is done uh, to expand the valve, as in this case, then you will see it uh, then. So uh, these are many differences, but the uh, purpose of putting this is not to just uh, confuse or bore. Uh, it is uh, to just highlight this point that uh, panus has a poor uh, relationship to anticoagulation as has been shown here and uh, thrombus has a very strong relationship and that was the point um, of uh, showing the uh, first case. Um, the next one is a 50 year old male uh, post uh, DVR in uh, double valve replacement in 2002 admitted now with um, a GI bleed with severe anemia. Uh, so, no cardiac symptoms as such, but apparently some history of uh, long hospital stay, some history of fever in the hospital. So, there, <coughs> there were some uh, concerns. So, what you can see here is the um, uh, two prosthetic valves. What you can see here is um, a fairly triangular contour, but you are seeing that um, the mean gradient is uh, 22 as has been shown here. Uh, peak velocity is just over three, uh, aortic velocity, uh, DVI is normal, uh, acceleration time is also normal, uh, that is less than 80. 80 by 80 is also normal, less than 0 0.32. Um, it all fits in uh, with the normal thing. So this uh, elevation in gradients, uh, he had a hemoglobin of uh, four, uh, which subsequently came up to around um, six or eight with transfusions. But um, this is uh, most likely related to his um, anemia. So uh, these are all thing, important things to consider. What is the hemoglobin of the patient uh, when we are looking at uh, high gradients? Um, uh, extremely important. Um, then uh, in, in the same patient, uh, so the TE also was done. And what you can see is the orthogonal view here. You can see the uh, tilting this valve uh, moving uh, nicely. And, uh, Color flow is uh, also shows some turbulence, but you see the same across the uh, mitral valve also. So it is all as a result of uh, high flow. So again, coming back to this algorithm, um, you can uh, see that it is a triangular thing, a contour with a DVI of greater than 0 0.3. And um, so it's a high flow uh, setting. Now you can have, uh, uh, with aortic, uh, uh, not only aortic, any prosthetic valve, you can have shadowing. So this is again very important to know uh, as a as a as an idea, uh, so that um, we uh, we see ways of overcoming this problem. For instance, uh, you have this particular parasternal long axis view. 
and uh, you can um, uh, see that this particular part where my marker is is not seen clearly because of shadowing so if this part had a problem obviously this view is not going to show it very well you would need to go to another view which will uh, show this particular part clearly so that is the point of uh, using multiple windows to ensure that any part that has been missed uh, is seen very uh, clearly uh, so that is um, what is uh, kind of illustrated using this uh, trans esophageal and trans uh, thoracic uh, pictures here um, uh, to show that uh, the, here in image uh, this particular image this area is obscured it's not seen clearly uh, but this area which is uh, <coughs> seen clearly is not what is seen clearly in this particular trans esophageal image here so that is the point whereas this part was not seen clearly in the trans thoracic echo uh, that is corresponding to this part uh, that is seen better here so that uh, so these two modalities are also can be used complementarily to look at the entire aortic annulus and make sure that uh, no part is uh, missed so these are all findings of a normal one uh, so uh, like in this particular case also you can see that this part is not seen clearly but that part uh, has been overcome uh, by um, uh, the transesophageal echo, which can see this part very clearly. So that was the point. Use of multiple windows, make sure that you get over the shadowing. This is a third illustration, uh, third case, which is again taken from the guideline document. Um, so you see there's LVOT is 18 millimeters. Uh, peak velocity is uh, greater than four. Mean gradient is also high. 42. But the thing is, this is a very nice triangular contour. And also, uh, the other important thing to note is that the DVI is also uh, normal. Um, uh, the, these are not playing. But as you can see in the two uh, phases of the cardiac cycle, uh, the valve leaflets are nicely moving and are fully open. So uh, um, uh, in the setting of something like this, a triangular contour, and also uh, your uh, valve area being low, uh, we should think of a, um, a patient process uh, mismatch. So again, a normal DVI, triangular contour um, with a small valve area uh, that you think of a, a patient process this, um, mismatch. Now these gradients don't really change over time. That is the other thing to bear in mind. So, um, uh, what does that mean? A patient has undergone a surgery today. Uh, after a month, we have done a study. Uh, we get uh, we get uh, findings like this. It is unlikely that uh, it is going to uh, change over time. I mean, unless there are additional problems which develop, uh, the gradients are likely to almost remain the same, as in it, they are likely to remain elevated uh, with the findings of a normal um, opening and closing of the valve leaflet. So that points towards uh, prosthetic uh, patient processes uh, mismatch. So why is this important to know? Um, why have I brought it here? We should not just gloss over this and just uh, go on to the next thing. This is because this is the most common cause of high gradients. Um, and uh, what does it mean? What is the mismatch? Uh, the mismatch is basically that the valve is too small for a given uh, patient. So this, like I said, is one of the causes of non-structural valve uh, dysfunction. So again, uh, coming to another algorithm. So you uh, don't worry about these algorithms. Just try to understand what is the concept behind it. So well, like in this particular case, we got a high gradient. But the, pa <coughs> uh, the patient's valve uh, um, reference um, EOA was, uh, was less. Um, that is, uh, it was less than 0 0.85 per meter square. Um, and that is why we considered uh, patient uh, processes mismatch. What do I mean by that? Um, we need to, when the patient comes for the echo, we need to see what valve has been Im uh, implanted. Uh, we need to uh, look at a particular table, which I'll just show you. There are many such tables available. So we will know what is the uh, predicted EOA for that particular patient. So we know what is the reference from that particular chart. Uh, we will know what is the, um, the patient's body surface area. If the uh, patient's uh, uh, indexed uh, EOA is less than uh, uh, 0 
or less than 0.65, then it is very severe. So we know straight away um, in the presence of uh, triangular jet, in the presence of normal closing and opening of leaflets, that what we are dealing with is uh, patient processes um, mismatch, um, as I have just uh, now, this is uh, the table. Uh, this is not the table. There are many such tables available. We'll, we can customize it based on, for our own labs, based on what valves we are using. Um, more often, we can get all these uh, numbers and uh, keep it handy so that we will realize uh, that, uh, like, say, for example, you take a valve like, uh, which is size 19, um, and you look at all the different uh, effective orifice areas. You will see that some have uh, a valve area of 1.0 plus minus 0.3 here, whereas others have 1.6 plus minus 0.4. So there is a lot of difference, um, even in a size 19 valve. So that is the importance of knowing. So if I know that this patient has undergone, my patient has a St. Jude's uh, medical regent valve, I should be expecting something like this. I index it to his body surface area. And I find that um, uh, it is um, less, uh, meaning it is less than 0 0.85. And uh, what I calculate is also around that. Then I know that we are dealing with patient processes uh, mismatch. That is the valve function per se is okay, but it is too small for the given particular uh, patient. That is what we, uh, that is what it means. Now, uh, I just told you uh, how to diagnose a patient processes mismatch. That is what the guideline also uh, just tells. But um, now we also, as echocardiographers, as, uh, um, uh, prof as, uh, um, as people looking at uh, and assessing echo, we also need to know um, um, how to avoid this or how to um, uh, uh, project an effective orifice area. So that is pre-operatively. So how we do it is to first calculate a body surface area as usual. Then we uh, determine what is the minimal projected area. So as you can see, you multiply it by 0 0.85. Why 0 0.85? Because anything less than 0 0.85 centimeter square per meter square body surface area of valve area is uh, considered um, not good, is considered uh, obstructive. And hence, we need at least this much of a valve area. So we multiply that by our uh, body surface area and we get a value of around 1.4. Now we need to choose the processes by looking at the chart. So uh, we can do that by going to a chart like this, the same chart. And we can choose that uh, for which valve will give me uh, uh, orifice area of greater than 1.4. So uh, randomly certain numbers have been looked at here. So if I'm looking at uh, this particular valve, um, I can take this. Or if I'm looking at uh, size 23, then I can take this. Uh, so it is like that. So again, across different sizes and different uh, valves, uh, the orifice area may be different. So that is another thing to uh, note. So it is not a standard thing as in 19 will mean only the same effective orifice area for all valves. That is not true. Uh, what we need to do is to look and try to assess which valve will be suitable for uh, this particular patient. We can have option one, two, three, and then there will be other factors also coming into play when we make the decision. Uh, this is just grossly, uh, again, uh, pooling everything together. It's a rough way of kind of estimating. Um, all these red areas, as you can see here in the chart, um, would mean that we should not go for this. So let's say uh, 1.6 meter square body surface area um, with a 19 mm valve would not be okay for our patient. Whereas 21 would be okay because it will give an indexed effective orifice area of 0 0.88. So that is the, the whole point is to make use of such, such charts. It's otherwise very hard to remember. And um, it is good in the echo lab when the patient comes, uh, say, with severe AS going for an AVR to look at uh, what would be the required uh, valve, minimum valve area for this particular uh, patient and maybe communicate that to the surgeons also. The next thing is to measure the aortic annulus actually. So that we have already done. We can also use other measurements uh, by CT or, of course, the surgeon does it intraoperatively also. 
uh, so the uh, thing to note here is uh, that uh, what we measure here does not take into account all uh, the measurement post excision now there may be a lot of calcium thickened tissue etc which he will get rid of and that will what uh, that is what he will finally use uh, after his sizing for uh, uh, putting the valve so if we find uh, that um, uh, so to prevent uh, patient processes mismatch um, like i said we can uh, we need to do those calculations we can think of uh, better valves uh, more recent valves with better hemodynamics we can look at the root enlarging procedures uh, to accommodate a larger prosthetic valve or uh, we can consider uh, newer therapies um, also like tavi now why is this important uh, this is important because uh, like i said it has a higher uh, mortality higher rate of hospitalization patients uh, even if they um, don't die may have a, re a reduced effort tolerance so the very aortic stenosis that we were uh, trying to get rid of uh, we have given it in a new form to the patient with the burden of anticoagulation and things like that so we have not really helped the patient uh, in that sense also uh, if we have uh, put in a biological valve or a bioprosthetic valve uh, we need to know that uh, the degeneration also will be faster if there is patient processes uh, mismatch uh, how common is it now we should not assume that this is something rare and hence we should be scared of reporting um, this is fairly common and uh, these numbers are not from uh, our centers uh, this is from prominent groups uh, like from quebec and uh, others uh, who have been working on uh, prosthetic valves so the numbers for moderate prosthetic uh, patient processes mismatch uh, goes up to up to 70% may have uh, some amount of patient processes mismatch and severe patient processes mismatch may be seen in up to 20% cases so it's not like it is uh, very uncommon and especially when we have metallic valves it is certainly something to uh, look out for um there are certain populations who uh, would uh, we should be very careful and kind of uh, take into account even when we look at and calculate uh, their um, valve area prior to the uh, surgery or um, what kind of valve they should have uh, these are certain groups those with lv dysfunction they will not tolerate a mis uh, patient prosthesis mismatch very well uh, those with lv hypertrophy those with um, concomitant mitral regurgitation uh, those with a paradoxical low flow low gradient or even a uh, low gradient as um younger patients because they will have this uh, burden for a longer period of time so these are all patient populations where we need to be um careful and ensure that that they get the biggest valve possible that is the short message uh, the short message is that uh, patients with these conditions we should not compromise on uh, putting in a small valve for these patients we should try and give them uh, the biggest valve um, which is possible uh these are all uh, uh, this is again a table from the uh, same uh, document on patient processes mismatch uh, this is for your reference you can just uh, go through it um, if you whenever you uh, feel like um yes uh, so uh, again from the same document uh, this is the one point that i would like to make when you are uh, looking at patient processes mismatch obviously if you go on putting on weight and your body mass uh, index is high um uh, the measurements are going to be different so indexed eoa this applies for uh, body mass index less than 30 uh, kg per meter square but when it is um, more than 30 kg per meter square uh, this indexing does not uh, work very well in the same way and hence um, you have uh, different cutoffs that is 0.7 uh, is considered um, uh, normal um uh, and uh, less than uh, uh, 0.55 is considered uh, severe patient processes um, mismatch as opposed to 0.65 we have so just to know the influence of uh, body mass index on uh, calculating um on on indexing also uh, the other thing is um, that uh, sometimes uh, by leaflet valves you can have high gradients so that is uh, something to be also mindful of so you here you have a trace which is nice and uh, peak triangular you have nice valve flicks also seen and uh, fluoroscopy also shows that the valve leaflets are nicely open so this is just uh, a high gradient through the central orifice 
So if you actually manage to take it through the other orifice, you could uh, uh, probably the gradients also would go down. But that in practice is many times hard to do uh, to find that uh, other orifice, especially in the aortic uh, position. Uh, coming to the next case, um, uh, this is a 34 year old female had a double valve replacement in 2010. Uh, these are the valves. Um, she was adequately anticoagulated and was asymptomatic. She had actually come for routine evaluation prior to a best breast slump uh, surgery. Now these are the uh, valves. Um, um, you can see some color turbulence across the um, LVOT. And uh, you can see that the um, LVOT VTI is also slightly uh, increased. Um, your uh, aortic VTI, um, you know, the mean gradient is uh, elevated, but it is not really very rounded, uh, as you can see here, somewhere in between, you can say. And uh, then you have your DVI, again, which is not in the uh, severe range. When you take a closer look here, uh, you know, the valve is uh, probably somewhere there, uh, annular, and uh, as we saw, it was implanted in the supraannular position. But as you can notice here, the LVOT is quite uh, small or this LVOT is quite narrow. This is a problem that we might encounter sometimes in elderly patients also, uh, who may have a sigmoid septum here and the valve otherwise may be absolutely fine. Uh, you do everything possible, fluoroscopy or uh, TE and other things, to find the valve is fine, but uh, still there is a high gradient and turbulence. Uh, so that often is because of a small LVOT um, which uh, uh, we need to consider. So subvalve uh, narrowing is uh, something to uh, consider. The next case, this is not our case, um, just from uh, literature. Uh, Bileaflet mechanical valve um, done in 1998 on uh, uh, Coumadin, but uh, difficulty maintaining therapeutic INR comes with a progressive dyspnea on exertion for uh, six months. So again, uh, what you can see here is um, elevated gradients uh, here and uh, the, uh, the numbers are here. You can find that um, your aortic velocity is greater than uh, 3.6. Your DVI is also 0 0.33, uh, which is um, about in the normal range. Your acceleration time, however, is increased as you can see here. So what was the problem here? So if you have high velocity, you have a DVI which is uh, looking normal, but uh, your um, acceleration time is increased. And as I had already told, a contour which looks more rounded as compared to triangular uh, needs to be taken seriously. So where are we going uh, wrong or what is the problem? So the problem was uh, the recording of the LVOT Doppler. It was taken too close to the aortic valve prosthesis and hence the LVOT VTI was uh, elevated. So now with the proper numbers, uh, the, um, the, uh, the category itself uh, shifted to uh, significant obstruction. At this point, I would just like to mention, uh, number one is that we need to pay attention to um, all things, like what is the shape of the contour? Um, is, are we suspecting any kind of obstruction? All those clinical details are also important. Number two, we don't just blindly take um, all the numbers that are there and start processing and then start fitting them into an algorithm. Um, that we should refrain from. We should try to make sense of all the things that are there and then try to explain certain odd things. Like in this particular case, uh, the DVI was not okay, but other things were uh, all fitting in with a particular uh, situation, which is obstruction. Uh, and then uh, the person went back and remeasured and then came to a conclusion that uh, it was a wrong measurement. So that is also something to bear in mind. So it was obstruction and these were the uh, findings. Um, uh, uh, as you can see, um, the valve was uh, stuck and uh, there was tissue in growth also. That, that was the surgical uh, finding. The next case, a uh, 39 year old male had a DVR in 2018. Uh, he is asymptomatic. Uh, so this is uh, to highlight um, the point of uh, regurgitation. So these are asymptomatic patients come for a routine checkup uh, Transthoracic showed something, that is why this transesophageal was done. Uh, this is the, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, transesophageal, uh, nothing to worry. This is the aortic valve here. You can see this particular thing, uh, that is the regurgitation. 
and uh, this is the right ventricular outflow tract here and uh, the same thing has been uh, shown here in another view uh, a similar case again you have a 84 year old man uh, with no dyspnea or anything he's had an avr and cbg in 2019 he presents with an effort angina and he was found to have um, coronary problems and uh, that was uh, fixed but um, he had that uh, small leak on transthoracic echo uh, for which he was done and that was also found to be uh, not very uh, significant uh, what do i mean by uh, this not very significant uh, i'm not going to go into the depths of this but just for us to be aware that uh, prosthetic uh, aortic regurgitation also uh, is uh, somewhat like assessing native valves except that uh, there is this additional thing that we look uh, which is specific to assessing prosthetic valves wherein we look at uh, circumferentially in the short axis view uh, what is the extent of the paravalvular regurgitation anything more than 30 percent is severe and anything less than 10 percent is mild something in between is moderate uh, that is up, apart from the other usual parameters that we take for assessment of biotic uh, regurgitation so that is a simple way of kind of remembering that is this is not the only parameter uh, but um, uh, this is something uh, to know for now. Uh, the next case is a 73-year-old male, uh, post CABG in 2002, TAVI in uh, 2018. Uh, he's asymptomatic, uh, class 1. Uh, again, you can see that um, this I had shown earlier. There was a, There is a bit of regurgitation that you are seeing here. And the same regurgitation you are seeing here at around 5 o'clock uh, position. This is the zoomed view of the apical five chamber and you are seeing this regurgitation uh, from the same five o'clock position. So how do we uh, look at this uh, clock phase? This is again from, the, uh, from last year's um, uh, uh, regurgitation guidelines for um, post uh, uh, TAVI. Uh, and this is how the clock phase is. And uh, in the different views you can assess. So our patient had a regurgitation somewhere here. Uh, and that is why it is somewhere around the five o'clock uh, position. Uh, this is an extensive document for those of us who are interested. We can go to it. Uh, it's the ASC uh, document, um, 2019. Uh, this is, again is not uh, our case. This is from literature. Uh, 81 year old um, with uh, dyspnea or progressive dyspnea on exertion. Uh, he's had a CABG and an AVR in 2003. Uh, in the T, it was difficult to visualize the mechanical valve. Not a very uncommon scenario. Despite trying all our multiple windows and all that, sometimes we may, may not be able to see the valve uh, very clearly. But again, um, when we have Dopplers like this, we don't really need to uh, worry. Because again, what you see here is a rounded contour, 150 milliseconds, elevated uh, gradients. And um, uh, putting everything together. A DVI is also very useful in this particular case. We are re relying more on Doppler now. Uh, so as you can see, a D DVI is uh, low, uh, 0.18, and you have a very prolonged acceleration time. And uh, this patient um, had uh, PANUS. Um, so uh, a diagnosis was uh, made and the valve was uh, changed. The next is a 84-year-old male, uh, again, uh, CAPG plus AVR in um, 1997. Uh, he's had an angioplasty subsequently. Subsequent uh, angiogram shows that um, the coronaries are fine. Uh, he's been, uh, uh, apparently, he was told to maintain a subtherapeutic INR. So we didn't have any details of his uh, valve also, what was done. But all we knew was he was advised to maintain a subtherapeutic INR. He had come with uh, worsening dyspnea for a few months and he was in uh, heart failure. So um, uh, his LV function also had gone down over time. This was, his valve was stable. Um, we could see these uh, reverberations here. That is the um, color Doppler, which shows some turbulence across the valve. And also you can see um, that there is uh, regurgitation. Uh, this regurgitation most likely is um, uh, intraprosthetic from within the valve, as you can see here. Meaning to say that there is um, likely some amount of obstruction also. Or the closing mechanism is not okay. That is why you are seeing this uh, regurgitation as compared to the previous case where you saw it coming from outside the valve. This is a zoomed view which again shows the kind of restricted mobility uh, of this uh, valve leaflet. 
So the uh, gradients are not very high, possibly because of the um, LV dysfunction. You are also seeing the AR here. Uh, this is to just to show that there was uh, some flow reversal, meaning to say that uh, this patient had the aortic valve regurgitation, which was uh, uh, significant. And that was also evident on the color Doppler. So this was uh, his old, uh, during his angio um, uh, in 2017, uh, just one frame which kind of showed this uh, again sorry it's not uh, playing uh, it's a frozen image but this is the maximum excursion uh, and uh, uh, so it seemed to be fairly uh, opening and closing all right but uh, there was still documented ar uh, way back in 2013 uh, with a normal lv function so possibly there was something which was um, not really uh, being picked up uh, in which case uh, so these are cases where uh, panis is a possibility, there's a gradual worsening of symptoms, nothing very obvious otherwise. Um, and panis is not also not very obvious in what we have looked for so far. So uh, CT may be uh, useful in some of these cases, especially if the valve uh, uh, or the metallic valve uh, is itself not, um, uh, you know, uh, causing a lot of artifacts. In that case, a CT will, will be ideal as has been shown in this particular case. It will show a high attenuation uh, in the areas that have been marked with the um, uh, arrows. So uh, this is just to illustrate the point that uh, CT can be used. Again, differentiating panels and thrombus. Looking at the attenuation value on CT, uh, attenuation value means it tells us about how dense it is. Uh, so panels is uh, like scar tissue, hence the density will be more, uh, it will be more uh, bright and hence uh, it will have a greater value as compared to thrombus, which has a lower um, um, attenuation value. So sometimes you can have both. A valve, uh, it's not like uh, one will have thrombus and that, that cannot have panus. So you can have uh, thrombus with panus also. So there, uh, the CT can come in uh, very uh, handy. You may be able to see both and may be able to uh, distinguish one from the other by looking at the attenuation value. And that possibly would have been useful in the uh, in our case um, also, who already also had a subtherapeutic INR. So, um, and why we are missing it on ECHO could be because uh, CT picks up small things like this, especially if we get a good study. So that is the panus that is seen, uh, these small areas which have been marked. Uh, and that may be enough to kind of uh, prevent the closing and opening mechanism in the valve and uh, cause problems. The next is a 77-year-old male. Uh, this is a tissue valve, bioprosthetic valve uh, for a severe AS. He had fever and dyspnea nine days after surgery. Cultures are all negative. He had high gradients. Um, this is also not our case, but um, uh, kind of illustrate. So what, uh, this is a transesophageal uh, view. Again, what you can see here, is nice fleshy thickened uh, valves here. This is the iota and this is the LV here. This is the mitral valve. So again, in short axis view also, you are seeing these kind of thickened uh, leaflets with uh, some kind of masses uh, attached to it. So uh, what you can see after anticoagulation for three months is that uh, these nice thin leaflets, uh, so it's become completely normal. What was initially a rounded contour with a very high gradient uh, has now become a nice triangular contour uh, with a normalization of gradient also. The gradient now is 11 as compared to 48 uh, that was there previously. Um, uh, I'm not, uh, the purpose of uh, today is not to go into treatment guidelines and all, but to just to highlight that even bioprosthetic valves would need um, anticoagulation uh, with vitamin K antagonists. And as uh, also transcatheter aortic valves, uh, there will be many uh, further details, uh, nitty gritties to this. That is not in the scope of today's um, uh, discussion. Point is broadly, bioprosthetic al uh, valves also would require anticoagulation for a uh, definite uh, uh, period of time. It may be a short period, but they do require anticoagulation. Um, this is another uh, gentleman, 56 year old male. TAVI done in 2019. Um, in 2019, March, he's undergone a TAVI. And uh, October, uh, he came with pulmonary edema. And likewise, in February 2020, that is this year. And both times, he was thrombolized for valve thrombosis. 
he also happened to be on phenytoin for a seizure uh, disorder uh, not going into the echo of that point uh, because it is it would be quite obvious and um, also since uh, we are running out of time but this uh, the usefulness of ct also shows this particular mass here uh, which is the thrombus um, and uh, what you can uh, see here uh, this time uh, he came here for a um, follow up uh, that is this month just a few days ago and um, he was completely asymptomatic um, uh, everything was fine but in his routine echo uh, and this is the three chamber view or the apical long axis view something was not looking all right uh, it's moving the leaflets but uh, it looked a little uh, dirty uh, inside and um, uh, this is the apical five chamber view also which looks a little uh, not very clear um, so this was his um, uh, gradient it was 28 so for a uh, uh, Again, to take into note that uh, transcatheter valves, anything more than 20, uh, you uh, should not disregard uh, or you should not take it uh, lightly. Uh, this is an asymptomatic patient. He has a gradient of 28. Uh, he's come for follow-up, but with a previous history of uh, being thrombolized uh, for uh, valve uh, obstruction. This time again, CT was done um, and it picked up uh, these kind of small thrombi. And uh, subsequently, uh, he was uh, thrombolized, though he was asymptomatic. And uh, he, uh, he had um, a resolution of the thrombus, uh, nice laminar flow, uh, leaflets are thin, and uh, the gradient has also come down. And that is the uh, CT, which shows uh, that the thrombus is not there. Um, so these thrombi can be uh, subclinical. This is from an Anegium paper a few years ago and uh, just shows that whether it is uh, surgical bioprosthesis or uh, tower valve, they tend to have these things and they manifest as elevation in gradients with uh, some restriction in mobility of the valve. Again, going back to my initial point about looking at the valve leaflets very carefully in whatever views are possible, the patient does not have to be symptomatic. Um, we need to look at the valve leaflets very carefully and try to appreciate uh, and try to compare if we have images uh, from the previous uh, studies. That is the point of uh, uh, showing this. Um, the next one, 42-year-old male, has had an AVR uh, three months back, comes with fever and chills for two weeks, blood cultures, uh, growing staff. He's admitted with sudden onset dyspnea and shock. Um, this is to show that uh, there is a paravalvular leak here. Uh, that's, that's not the uh, moving clip, but uh, that is what you mean by a rocking uh, valve. This is again from uh, from literature, uh, just to show a rocking valve. Uh, the next is a 49-year-old male, uh, has had an aortic valve replacement in 2019, comes with fever for four months, um, and um, he's had a repair and AVR in November 2019. Um, the valve uh, culture shows atypical mycobacteria. Uh, so this is his chest X-ray. Just a uh, point of putting this was to identify the chest X-ray. So you uh, uh, just take an imaginary line from uh, the right, this angle, right, cardiophrenic angle, um, to the left uh, hilum, and uh, aortic valve will usually be above that as compared to the mitral valve, which is below. There are other ways also uh, which I'm not going to uh, go into. So what you can see here in this particular patient. Uh, is that this valve is looking a little unstable and there is uh, significant aortic regurgitation uh, which is seen in all these um, images. Uh, also what you can see is an echo-free space here and uh, this is certainly very significant aortic regurgitation. This is the abdominal aorta which shows frank uh, flow reversals uh, which are seen here which are all uh, definitely more than 20-30 um, in the end diastole signifying significant uh, regurgitation. The next one, so that was a patient of infected uh, prosthesis. The next one uh, is a 66-year-old male with um, post-AVR. Uh, he's had this uh, bileaflet uh, prosthesis one year ago, presents with sudden onset dyspnea and heart failure. Cultures are negative. Again, uh, the, um, sometimes 3D may be useful, as in this particular case, you are able to see the gap. Um, and the leak and also the area of uh, dehiscence. This patient underwent, uh, this is again from literature, this is again, uh, this patient underwent a homograph because he had aortic root dilatation also. And uh, subsequent to that also, he had a pseudoaneurysm uh, without any signs of infection. 
So that was subsequently repaired. So this, the, the whole idea of um, uh, showing uh, the, these things is that not everything may be obvious in echo. Uh, we may need to take the help of other uh, modalities and we should know what to use uh, when, the limitations of one over the other. And that will help us uh, come to, um, to a correct uh, diagnosis. Um, this is a 72-year-old uh, uh, patient with uh, low flow, low gradient AS, underwent TAVI in 2019. Uh, this, as you can see, there was LV dysfunction, but post uh, that uh, flow is uh, quite good. Gradients are also normal, triangular jet uh, gradient of around uh, less than 10. Uh, but uh, the uh, point here is to highlight the use of uh, strain. Um, the use of strain being um, that uh, if we can uh, uh, demonstrate an acute increase or the improvement in strain, that is something which is seen. Uh, that uh, can point to a promising uh, future uh, as opposed to something which uh, doesn't really change uh, much between uh, before and uh, after. So that is the point and that is the benefit of using strain also. Even on our routine patients, um, post AVR, if we uh, do pre and post, we might see, uh, we often see a change in uh, strain acutely. Um, this is uh, um, the last few cases. Um, a 51 year old male uh, post uh, CABG and star Edward for ball and cage in 2008 comes with worsening dyspnea and angina. Um, undergoes a PTCA and uh, stenting with uh, TAVI. Again, uh, this is uh, just to kind of uh, highlight that in the coming day, uh, uh, years, we may see more of this. Not uh, many of you at this point may be uh, seeing this, but this is uh, appearance. You, on the one hand, you have a very old valve, uh, a TAVI valve, but in the same patient, we will we, have, uh, we might be able to see uh, a, a very current or uh, contemporary uh, valve uh, who otherwise would have had a very challenging um, surgery due to other reasons also. Um, this is uh, a patient um, with a star Edwards valve in 1969. So uh, this is just for interest uh, sake, something I found in literature. Uh, star Edwards or ball and cage valve was introduced in 1960. This patient had it in 1969. Uh, now was not uh, the aortic valve was absolutely fine. Uh, that is 51 years later, aortic valve star Edwards is still fine. Patient was admitted for other reasons. So as you can see here, this is the aortic gradient. Mean gradient is barely 17. Um, this is the aortic valve here. But what the patient has is uh, mitral stenosis and regurgitation for which the patient was admitted. This is just a CP reconstruction uh, showing this um, star Edwards valve. 51 years and still functioning. So these are very durable valves, um, but um, the only problem was um, uh, thrombogenicity and uh, high gradings. Um, this um, is a 41 year old male. Again, uh, uh, 2005 um, uh, had a mean gradient uh, of uh, 42. Um, sorry, uh, this patient had a double valve replacement in 1997. Um, these were the two valves, ball and cage and a tilting disc valve, was now in uh, class one NYHA. Plot prosthetic sounds are also well heard, uh, but gradients were high. So this is again, just to uh, finally kind of sum up whatever we have uh, looked at today. Um, so what you can see here is the star Edwards valve here. The aortic prosthesis is also seen here. Uh, you can see the flow across the valves. Uh, this is the LVOT VTI tracing. This is the aortic VTI tracing. Uh, again, somewhere in between you would say, but the gradient, mean gradient is 41, so high gradient. Uh, so these are the details for the patient, the height, weight, body surface area, body mass index. Um, everything is there, mean aortic gradient, acceleration time almost touching 100. AT by ET uh, is um, uh, greater than 0 0.32. DVI is also 0 0.35. Effective orifice area, however, is 1.8. Indexed um, EOA is um, also on the normal side. So then what is the, uh, what is the issue? So we are finding uh, many of uh, these things from different uh, uh, categories, which is possible many times. So this is this particular uh, patient. And uh, uh, this is the X-ray where we say that uh, the aortic valve is in profile and um, uh, mitral valve is on fast um, and uh, 
we find that the aortic valve uh, is restricted in mobility. So this again, frozen images, this is the maximum opening and this you can see within the valve also, that is where it uh, stops. So the opening is about 30 degrees, that's all, which is markedly reduced. So that is the reason. So we are not seeing anything much otherwise. We even calculated a normal EOA, which I'll come to, uh, but we see that this is certainly a valve which has a, a problem. So we're talking about opening and closing angles, uh, we may be able to see it on fluoroscopy. So never uh, underestimate what fluoroscopy can do even today. So as echocardiographers also, we need to look at fluoroscopy in a complementary manner. We need to know when to send the patient. Uh, not everything can be answered by DVI and EOA. Uh, we need to take the full story into picture. We need to put the pieces together. We need to, and where it doesn't fit in. So like in this case, uh, we do a fluoroscopy. We need, we take help from other modalities and then we arrive at a conclusion. So this is a, it can be done by dynamic CT also. So this is a CT image. Uh, the only thing with CT is we should ensure that uh, not much of reverberations are there or artifacts. Otherwise it's a very good tool which can be used. Uh, so uh, here one on top is normal, nicely opening and closing. And what you can see here, it's um, uh, neither opening fully nor closing fully. So this is a restricted valve. Uh, and there is something which is preventing that uh, below the uh, valve tissue, most likely uh, panus. So this is not our patient, but just to highlight the uh, point. So uh, coming back to the uh, patient and looking at this opening and closing angle, uh, there are these kind of charts available again. Uh, so again, according to the valve, how much they are supposed to open and how much they are supposed to close on uh, fluoroscopy or CT, uh, there are these kind of uh, tables available, as you can see here. So our patient had a tilting disc valve, and as you can see, uh, there is uh, no tilting disc uh, mentioned here, which is uh, less than 60 degrees at least. Uh, even the oldest ones are 60 degrees, but ours had a markedly uh, restricted um, uh, opening and closing. So we know that uh, this is not a proper valve. Uh, once we know that uh, this is how it is supposed to behave, then we see how our patient is behaving. And then we arrive at the conclusion that uh, this is not okay. So uh, we went through all the data again, and we, we obviously realized the main problem was the measurement of the LVOP. So as you would have uh, realized by now, why I keep, um, uh, this is the third time and the third uh, time in, con uh, in succession that I have re repeatedly mentioned about accurate measurement of the LVOT. You measure the LVOT wrong, everything goes uh, haywire. The same thing, the results would be completely different if we had taken an LVOT diameter of 20 or somewhere there, which would have been most likely the case in this particular patient also. And looking at the images, we know that the LVOT diameter was not markedly dilated or anything uh, or any such thing. So we know that all the con confusion happened uh, because of uh, improper LVOT diameter measurement. So spend time uh, looking at the LVOT in zoom views and um, uh, doing it in a systematic manner, looking at the nature of the valve, the leaflets, uh, measuring the LVOT diameter, doing the LVOT uh, Doppler properly, making sure it's not too close to the valve. Again, uh, that will also cause an overestimation of valve area. Or making sure that um, our aortic uh, continuous wave Doppler measurements are also okay. We need to take into account all these things to finally come to a conclusion um, about our assessment. So uh, with that, I will stop and leave you with uh, this particular image. It is uh, good to keep this in mind and um, um, as, as, as we go on assessing the different uh, prosthetic aortic valves. Thank you all.